Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I am John Brown, President of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and it's uh, my great privilege and pleasure to, to welcome you to the Academy and to the Academy's first engineering design lecture. The Academy's involvement in uh, the London Design Festival is also a first. We've been delighted by the number and diversity of visitors participating across the week, and we're very grateful to the chairman of the London Design Festival, John Sorrell, himself an honorary fellow of this academy, for inviting us to take part. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Costain for their generous support of the academy's festival program. Design is very much at the heart of the Academy's activities. It's not only the fundamental discipline that underpins the wealth-creating and societal potential of all engineering innovations, but will also become vital in the years to come as the UK moves to an economy based on innovative, high-value businesses and industries. The Academy's theme for this year's festival is designing a low-carbon infrastructure for London. Much has been said of the need to reduce our carbon footprint and move to a low-carbon economy, and we now need to focus on how it will be done. Throughout my presidency, the Academy has concentrated its efforts on looking at how engineering will address major global challenges. In making the transformative change to a low-carbon economy happen, the role of the engineering profession is paramount and we're ready to lead the way. We're delighted tonight to have Keith Clark, Chief Executive of Atkins, to, to deliver the inaugural engineering design lecture and to give us the benefit of his experience and insight into the topic. As CEO of Atkins, Keith leads the UK's largest engineering and design consultancy and the world's 11th largest design firm. Under his leadership, Atkins has made a distinctive and early commitment to delivering innovative low-carbon engineering in conjunction with high-quality design. Keith's background also does much to explain his expertise and his passion for the Academy's festival theme. He's a chartered architect with a master's degree in urban planning from Pratt University, Brooklyn, and before joining Atkins in 2003, worked on projects around the world with Skanska, Trafalgar House, Olympia, and York. He also spent 10 years in the New York City Public Development Corporation. In addition, Keith is an advisory board member of the Built Environment Innovation Center at Imperial, and a recent chairman of the UK Construction Industry Council. All in all, he can offer us uh, 30 years of experience in urban regeneration, policy development, and the implementation of large-scale projects in construction and engineering. So Keith's going to talk to us, and at the end of the lecture, uh, there'll be plenty of time to have some questions and comments. So let's uh, welcome Keith to present his lecture, Decarbonizing and Celebrating the City, Why They Can't Be Mutually Exclusive. Keith. Well, good evening. Um, it's uh, always intimidating to be amongst an audience who I think probably can count because they're mainly engineers and I come from a background of architecture where, broadly speaking, we draw pictures and wave our hands. Um, that is always somewhat intimidating, but this is an area where probably there aren't any good numbers to talk about. It reminds me a bit of a, a chap that um, declared to his family that he wanted to be a a comedian, and they laughed. Well, they're not laughing now, was his famous quote at the end of his career. Um, we'll see if we can get you to laugh as we go through this. Now, there are many ways into looking at climate change and the resulting need to decarbonize. Um, uh, quite often, these debates become rather um, esoteric, um, what I call dinner party discussions of goodness and light. It would be nice if the world was fairer. It would be good if everybody cycled. Um, and it always reminds me of transportation debates. Before there was climate change and decarbonization as a major issue, um, 20 years ago we'd meet 
with people talking about transportation policy. And you'd, you'd sit with Ken Livingston and a bunch of other people in conferences, and you'd have the tram group, and you'd have the walking group, and the biking group, and the car group, and the electric car group, and the pogo stick group. It would be all these groups. And it would just be, you know, who can shout loudest for my method of transportation. There was no sense of synthesis. There was no sense of holistic modal split change, no sense of actually maybe you need all of those working in different ways in some sort of iterative fashion. And carbon uh, and, and climate change has really fallen much into the same trap, as did sustainability. So I'm going to go through a couple of things and start, first of all, with what we think the city perhaps should do. And the city has been quite maligned by people like Prince Charles. A city is where people are coming. We are urbanizing our societies. We can argue that's good or that's bad, but people are voting with their feet. Look at the numbers. Even if you slowed it down by half, we have a massive urbanization. The city does some good things, so people are doing it. Now, why? Why does it matter? There's always the talk, and I agree entirely, of the social fabric, the interaction. We're not doing this by a telephone call. We're doing it by actually meeting each other in a room. And that's quite important, that it is actually an interaction. Society is about people meeting each other. It is about culture. It's about going out to party afterwards. It's about choice. And that's something which isn't often talked about. It's about economic choice. Now go back to the Saltaires of the world, the model villages or the model pieces of urbanization where you worked for an individual company. Untenable today that you shouldn't have a choice of who you work for. Whether you be poor or educated or rich, untenable you shouldn't have an economic choice. Why is it untenable? Because actually we all need that choice to have security. The moment you don't have choice, you will be suppressed. That's the nature of the economic system that we have. For good or bad, you do need economic choice. And cities give you that ability to access other jobs, other careers. For the more fortunate of us, that gives us a richness of choice to change career. I've been a developer, a contractor, now running a consulting firm, been a city official, all in cities, without leaving my home, my community, the kids in school. And that's what cities allow you to do, providing the infrastructure is accessible. And that's why cities matter. Now, they may not be fair, and they may not actually be inclusive, but I'd argue for this debate, let's start with the premise, cities are a good thing. Not naturally a good thing. You still have crime, you still have pollution, you still have air quality, you still have social deprivation. Less noticeable if you're in the rural countryside, but it's there. And you have all of those to solve in the city. We are going to have cities. We are going to have an increasing number of cities. That is a great thing. Let's agree the criteria for this discussion that they are going to exist. They are going to have a reasonable degree of fairness, not arguing for a social utopia, not arguing for free travel for everybody, not arguing that everybody should have the same standard of housing, but they should have a minimum standard of housing. More or less the society we have now, but it should work. It should work. It should give gainful, dignified opportunities to use the public realm to come to lectures like this. Whoever you are, whatever race, whatever uh, color, you should be able to enjoy that in a civilized city. And that's why it matters. Right, so we've settled that. We're going to have a city. The engineering, I have to say, has never addressed any one of those social issues before it's been asked to. Never. And it still doesn't. As a community, and by the way, as in engineering, I would include all the environmentalists, the cost consultants, program managers, the architects, all the people in the built environment, okay? So let's be engineering in my language. is a very broad term of people, men and women, who define the physical environment and the way we move through it. Yeah? 
the way we actually arrive at places we want to go. The context that we actually circulate in is the built environment, including the shopping mall, the church, the school, the office building, the house. Absolutely vital. We give that dignity. But we're not going to have a social utopia. Engineering has never yet addressed that. We have done extraordinary things of curing problems. Air quality. We have solved problems. The engineering of, of actually clean engines for cars. Massive. Unleaded. Petrol. Massive. Because someone else posed the question. We have never, as a community, gone forward and posed the question. We have been superbly good at answering the question. On a global sense, the ozone hole was a classic where the community, the engineering community, decided there was a problem that was identified by science. We had an ozone hole. We didn't do anything to prevent the ozone hole occurring. What we did was do something to recognize it had deal with the, car, the, 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 the aerosols and all the issues to do with the manufacture and distribution and alternative technologies for your aerosols to remove the threat of the ozone hole. So we solved a problem. We didn't avoid it. Now that's quite interesting because you then get to something where we are now looking to avoid a problem. We are not looking to solve something which is manifesting itself with poor air quality outside, manifesting itself with homeless people on the street, manifesting itself with poor water quality or clean air. You're looking at avoiding a future problem, and that changes it. Now, I'm going to start with a quick bit of background on the Accord and why we have a phenomenal opportunity. Okay? First thing is we have a phenomenal opportunity. First of all, our country signed up to the Copenhagen Agreement. That says 136 countries will limit the degrees of temperature difference to two degrees at a maximum. That is a phenomenally far-reaching decision that that many people have agreed as nations to change the basis of their economy, the basis of their economic growth. What everything has been dependent on since the Industrial Revolution is coal and oil and other things that are carbon intensive. We have decided globally to change the game. And that's not convenient, but we've done it. That's a great starting point. No one knows how to do it, by the way. We'll come on to that. Next thing is, this country has a Climate Change Act. I don't know how many of you have read the Climate Change Act. Um, it's actually pretty good. And if you read the subsequent documentation coming out of government, again, it's pretty good. Actually, it's world class. Nobody else has done it. Nobody else is close to where we have got as a society to saying we have a cunning plan, albeit, I think, naive in places, but it would be. It's the first time it's been done. A cunning plan to move us down through 2020 and then to 2050 to materially decarbonize our society, which means a 32% reduction at a minimum. A phenomenal change. Now, those of you who have done any of the numbers will know none of this is going to be achieved by the stuff we currently do. We're talking about a change which is beyond what your existing practices and technologies will achieve. This is not about changing your light bulbs. It is not about right, taking the odd bike ride. It is about a fundamental decarbonizing of the way you use cities and create cities and manage cities. Come back to my first point. It would still be nice to go out to the theater. It would still be able, nice to be able to travel to my other job that I want to apply for. Don't tell the shareholders. Right? You need to be able to travel around the community. You need that choice. So telling me you've carbon priced the uh, tube ticket at £15.20, because that's the real price of carbon for your tube electricity supply, does not solve the problem. Cities must function. And that's why the title of this lecture is what it is. You can't stop things. It's about doing things. And the next thing is we have two mayors, Ken and now Boris, quite different people, I mean radically different people, who have... Um, uh, made London effectively a de facto pilot project. The London plan 
actually says we're going to have a 60% reduction from 1990, which was about 50 million tonnes a year for London. We're going to reduce it by 60% by 2025. And that very crude terms is about 18 million tonnes. You're going to go from, and actually the growth has made it go up to about 55, 56 million tonnes per annum now. We're going to, the objective of Boris, Ken before, but Boris is right there, to make it 18 million tonnes. Now, I have to say, for those of you who are interested in the numbers, how you ring-fence that and calculate it is a little bit esoteric. And the leakage on those numbers is conceptual. Don't worry. Don't worry about the fact you can't actually do the calculation properly. Relax. It's fine. Okay? Nobody else can do it either. Right. Treat it like the banks treat lending. Arbitrary and capriciously, okay? <laughs> and actually, the models in carbon and climate change, I say, at the top level, if you go back to the global issue, the global issue of looking at climate change modeling, the work that's been done in the IPCC, is extraordinarily good. And much of the work that's been done actually is recalculating stuff that had been done 10 years ago, and you now have computer models that can actually do it with the data that existed before, and we just didn't have the computing power to do it before. So a lot of the reworking of numbers is not because someone made it, did it wrong. It's because we didn't have the computing power and the knowledge and the method to do it better. It's still not perfect. It is still a probability curve. But the difference is not that you might win the lottery. The difference is you might kill everybody. It's kind of serious. You might have social dislocation. It's so extreme Life is untenable for billions of people. So you're in that game. That modelling is extraordinarily good. When you get down to where we are, design professionals, turning up Monday morning, in front of a CAD screen, turn on your CAD screen, not much point me giving you the IPC global model for climate change and the relationship between parts per million and two degrees. That doesn't quite help you with your client at 10 o'clock. You need to have something fundamentally different. So let's look at the good news. Good news is you've got three layers of legislation and commitment in London to radically change the way we run and invest in this city because it will radically change it. Okay? I'm strongly of the view, and it'd be a great debate when people argue with it, that this is not a nice-to-have and it will all get paid for and uh, there's no extra cost and it will be fine and good design will solve everything. I've never seen any market condition in any country where if you decide to ration something, be it movement, water, power, ability for people to speak, you ration anything severely or change its availability, other things change radically. It causes unfairness. It causes disruption. It causes other things to become cheap or expensive. That's what rationing does. It also has always unintended consequences. Some great stories out recently about the Blitz. Yeah? A lot of them were about the black market. How good the black market was. You could buy anything during the war. And at the 50 years, 70 years, we can make those stories now because we're far enough away. You start to ration carbon, you will have that disruption on society, which is cracking good. Now, Good news is you have all those layers of, of, of demand that we get rid of carbon. That's the great news. Yippee, that's billions of investment. What a great opportunity for the engineering community. The broad, what a fabulous, fabulous opportunity with that level of commitment, at global, national, and city level. That's the good news. The bad news is our industry, albeit one of the best in the world, is not fit for purpose. Not for this purpose. And that's a bit of a problem because we don't have very long. In fact, we don't have very long at all. Um, it's sort of now. Because 2050, 2040 is now in terms of capital projects. Now, quickly, I'm going to go through the design life of a building. Normally, a client comes to us, says, I like a building, architects in the room will tell you. Nine months to design, maybe a year. Planning consent, 18 months. Start construction immediately. Two years to build, okay, it's three and a half years. You're very lucky. 100% occupied day one. 
you know, completely full day one. It takes you two years to get any climate data out of it because the first year, none of the systems are balanced and it was a hot summer. <laughs> so to get any reasonable numbers, it always takes two years. That's five and a half years, over half a decade. Now, you're a really good design team because you actually have been smart enough to embed enough monitoring. You are really going to get really good data out of that building. For all the clever things you did at five and a half years ago, you're going to learn, and you actually have the same design team, you plug that knowledge right in, and you learn. Off you go, you do it again. You'll have one iteration in 10 years. Okay, that's great. We're now 2010. Uh, we have to get a 32% decarbonisation nationally by um, uh, 2050, 40 years from now. Are you going to do it that well? I don't think so. Oh, we can do 60% from 1990 in London. Well, hang on a minute. That's by 2025. That's 15 years away. Hmm, interesting. That's a building. Let's work on Crossrail. Let's look at the design lifetime of Crossrail. It's only been going 20 years. Uh, Thameslink 2000, still under construction. It's only a decade off. Um, you look at the way uh, Heathrow, fourth terminal, terminal five, uh, eight years in planning, another four or five years in building, total project about 18 years. Um, the river crossing down at um, Thamesmead started in 1960. We haven't decided to do it yet. Um, look at the tube upgrade. The PPP took five years to agree the PPP. Our society cannot move at that rate if we are going to decarbonise at the rate, the minimum rate that we need to. So where does that leave us as, as an engineering community, community? It leaves us in a very different place. Now, one of the great things about the Victorians was actually not their successes, the great things about the Victorians was their glorious mistakes. The utter cock-ups, you know? The vacuum-powered steam uh, train that Brunel wanted. Yeah, a complete failure. Actually, we could probably do it today because you have funny, flexible rubber things that work today. You didn't then. You had bits of leather with wax. Massive failures. The Great Eastern ended up being a cable-laying ship. You know, the, the balance saloon never worked. You go through the infrastructure... Um, the number of canal companies that went bankrupt, the number of railway companies that went bankrupt. Infrastructure is a fascinating area to lose money in. Okay? Lots of people lose money. The second group usually make money. Real estate, Canary Wharf lost a fortune. Actually, the second crowd made a fortune, but it was also made up out of people from the first crowd, like Paul Reitman came in again. Great trick if you can do it. Um, but that's a characteristic of infrastructure, and cities are infrastructure. Forget about whether they're privatized and you've got a different network rail or if it's Thames water. It doesn't matter. It has the same long cycle time. It has the same reluctance to take risk. Now, there is a fundamental difference between engineering the built environment and engineering my phone. And Boris Johnson, interestingly, when he was running for election, said um, something like a quote. He said, why is it we can't call the tube? This is ridiculous. The tube, no one's telling me we can't afford to make the tube cool in the summer. Whereas I can get all this technology on my phone and it gets cheaper every year. It's really interesting. There is a difference, but not that much of a difference. If this fails, I buy another one. If the screen fails, they withdraw it. If the tube fails or the M25 surfacing fails, we stop the economy. When we closed network rail about 15 years ago because somebody hadn't maintained the track properly, it caused massive economic loss and social disruption and people lost their jobs because the economy slowed down. Absolutely punitive for society. So when we make a mistake, it hurts a lot of people. It just doesn't hurt a few shareholders of, of uh, Apple. They can go bankrupt. It doesn't actually change society. When we get it wrong, it really matters. So what are we? We're risk adverse. Perfectly reasonable. That's great if you don't need to change your product. That's great if you're very happy having the same risk profile. That's great if you think what you do today works tomorrow. 
That's great if you are actually not interested in technology, if you're not interested in de evolving on an iterative basis. And then it gets even more inconvenient. How do you define your question? You've now got a little piece of the city you're playing with. Do you start talking to the tenants about how they will drive to work? Do you start talking to them about should you actually not hire people who are coming from a long way away? Should you actually start changing the canteen so it doesn't deal with meat? Should you start just looking at harvesting grey water? Should you look at the whole life cycle? There's a good study that says carpets in most office buildings, actually in all office buildings, use up more carbon over the life cycle of the building than the building fabric does, i.e. the concrete structure. You build the concrete structure once, we rip out the carpet about every five years, massive carbon footprint. Really interesting. So are we designing stuff with longer carpets? No, we're worried about taking out concrete. You can do both. How do you as a design team on Monday morning start to choose those things? Now, another characteristic. So the first characteristic is we are loath to make mistakes. Good thing. <coughs> Pretty essential thing, actually. We also don't like to have open-ended answers. As a community, you quite like to know you've got it right and not have a better answer but the answer. So instead of dealing with something you can cope with and not dealing with something that's outside of your ken, we try and solve everything. And again and again we see worthy discussions of solving the world. We need to look at the embedded, the social, the transportation, and we're not equipped for it. Usually it's by people of the wrong discipline making the discussion anyway. We don't glue together the right people early enough because we're used to a different design process. And that's kind of a problem, unless you want to do what we always did. That's the second sort of friction issue. Third issue is your client hasn't asked you to do it. Your client hasn't come to you and said, uh, oh, by the way, I've taken your ROBA scope of services, and I've added this whole chunk at the beginning where I'd like you to look at zero carbon for the building. Okay? Happens occasionally. This needs to happen on every single project. Okay? Go to Ian Coucher of Network Rail and talk about carbon. He's worried about how much money he's going to get out of government and whether or not the West Coast Mainline will open again on Monday morning, because if it doesn't, he loses his job. And a bright spark like me turns up, I'm so like to talk about your carbon footprint, doesn't get past the coffee machine yet. How do we actually then go into clients? Because you're the engineering community. <coughs> We don't equip ourselves, we don't train our graduates, we don't train our managers, we don't train our organisations to engage with clients for a question they don't understand. Now a few do, Marks and Spencer, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, there are a few people that really get it, really get it. You go into their organisation and it's interesting, talking to a guy in Marks and Spencer's, fairly senior guy, how many people in Marks and Spencer's get there is no plan B? Yeah, you all know about that. There is no, yeah. Very forward-thinking stuff. Very sort of rounded, intellectually sound, cohesive view of the world they've done. Absolutely stunning. So how far does it go through the organisation? Well, it doesn't get to the store managers. Oh, hang on a minute. Store managers in the retail are like up here. Yeah, but they're just worried about sell foot. You know, they, they've read all the stuff, but they don't get it. They do it because we tell them. All right, and you pitch up your design teams, and you could do it for rail, you can do it for water, you can do it for, for transportation modes, you can do it. Anything to do with the city, the same thing will apply. You pitch up and you say, there is this issue that we're going to decarbonize by 2025 by 60% against this number. I don't know how to relate that to your project, how many tons I have to take out of your project. I have no actual calculation for that. I have no design tool which counts that, but it's a big issue for you. Trust me, we don't actually articulate it that well. Why not? Highly educated group of people. But when it comes to issues like that, as a profession, we stand on one foot and wonder why no one listens to us. We don't engage in that iterative fashion. And that's a bit of a problem. So it's these sort of characteristics of the industry which are kind of worrying that we're not progressing to that level. Sometimes it manifests itself in two ways. 
And I've seen this at, uh, I've seen it at the ICE, I've seen it actually at the ROBA. Um, uh, two sort of bodies. And the first is what I call um, uh, the socialist utopian body. Okay? Um, we just need someone to make the rules to make everybody do it. Okay? We need the rule that says every house should be zero carbon. You sh every existing house that you own shall be made to be retrofit. Um, everybody will have a zero carbon. You know. And I've, I've heard this said in all seriousness. You're going to come into your house and tell you what to do with your property. The absolute sort of Stalinist, centralized government, we are going to tell you how to live. Okay? There was a, 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 a thing on the radio, Radio 4, the other morning, talking about sustainability. And a chap said, this is nonsense, talking about some of this uh, trading. You have to tell people they can't do it. And it was a very well-known sort of green guru. You have to tell people, okay, you're not going to tell me what to do with my house. You're not going to tell me what to do with my travel pattern in a dictatorial fashion. You're going to have to bring me along. We're not going to have a state-run economy. Oh, by the way, what's interesting about those economies, they kind of went out of fashion because they didn't work. They failed because they couldn't react. They became monolithic and single direction and hopelessly inefficient. At the point, well, actually, we're looking at a rate of change and dancing with the technical issue that never was achieved in that sort of dictatorial state-bound stuff. Then you have the other end, and that's usually sort of 20% of the argument. Just tell us the rules. Of course, as engineers, it's great to have rules. But if you give me a rule, I don't have to engage with anybody. I go down and do the numbers. Okay. It plays to our weakness and our strengths of being great problem solvers. Give me the rules. Give me the brief. The more constrained it is, the happier I am. The easier it is to get the design team working. We can have really good fun. In fact, it doesn't address and interface with any other modal splits, social economic issues, or the climate change problem. Oh, that's sort of unfortunate, but we'll put a windmill on top and it'll be fine. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Now, the other camp, that's one camp, you're sort of, give me the rule, socialist dictatorship rule. And the other one is, well, it's all right, it'll be done by the market. Okay? Now, the market, Nick Stern, you have to say, is not a bad brain. Okay? Nick Stern was asked by Africa, all of Africa, which is kind of cool, they actually got themselves together, unlike all of Europe and the rest of the world. They actually sort of formed a block and said, Nick, will you represent us at Copenhagen? So is a man representing a continent. That's kind of cool. Okay? Good brain. First report, he says, climate change is the biggest fa market failure that mankind has ever experienced. The biggest market failure. So we're going to rely on the market to solve this? I'm a great market believer. I think the market is a wonderful thing. It's stupid, okay? It's not adroit, and it, but it behaves to some simple rules. That's why it works. And it's because it fails that it works. Because companies fail and others succeed. That's what markets are about. It's about competition. Competition is about winners and losers, not equality, not fairness, not reasonableness, and not unintended consequences. Like it or not, that's what markets are. We, people that run companies, want monopolies. The Monopolies Commission tries to stop us. That's what it's about. I've always wanted a monopoly. No one's ever given me one. Very unfair. Actually, it'd be quite boring, because once you have a monopoly, you become inefficient and dull and just try and protect it. That's what the market forces are about. They're not about solving the climate change. They're about making money. They're about winning. They're about preserving. That's what it's about. Except that it won't solve a fair society, a reasonably fair society. I'm not asking for social utopia. It's not going to come. A reasonably fair society. We all have a vested interest in a fair society. It means you don't get mugged on the way home. It means actually your children can move around in societies which are equitable and reasonably fair, reasonably fair. 
What a terrible place if it starts to become diverse. If UK has done extraordinary things with its cultural diversity, and London is stunning compared with other places I go to. Absolutely stunning. You want to preserve that. Climate change could destroy it. And engineering is part of that answer, and quite an important part of that answer. Now, engineering, having said you're not fit for purpose, we're not fit for purpose because we don't like making mistakes, we do like rules, we're not very good at talking to clients, we're not very good at iterating knowledge, we're not very good on the time frame. The structural issues of the way we design don't work because it takes too long to get data back. Okay, now let's look on the good news. If the engineering, I mean architecture, doesn't engage in this, who else is going to do it? You have a phenomenal market. You have the intellect. You have bodies like the academies, the institutes. Incredibly powerful bodies. You have the motivation. You have the skills. Why aren't we arguing now for a different fee structure that moves fees, not greater fees, but moves the design effort to the front to reflect a different design process? Why aren't we lobbying not for a better standard, but an iterative learning with academic? And we, we barely talk to academia. What a loss. At the moment, the government talks to universities and we talk to government. Actually, we should be engaged with academics and then telling government what we can do for them. Don't wait for the politicians. Our great opportunity is to move from phenomenal world-class question solvers to question definers. That does mean you have to be happy to get it wrong. God, we, but we must get it right. Think of my, 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 my professional indemnity insurance. Think of our reputation. I mean, we, 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 has, we have to get it right. You can't fail. Actually, if you're, if you're innovating, you will fail. You will take risk you've never taken before. Otherwise, it ain't innovation. I was talking to the RSCS this morning in government about can you have facilities management contracts with innovation written in. How on earth can you write in innovation on something which is a contract which is about delivering teacups? Yeah? and predictability over 30 years. Everybody's paranoid, you're going to rip me off. So you can write in innovation. No, you can't. You do innovation because the design professionals go to the client and say, I know you only bought this, but you could have bought something else. And I will work with you to give you something better. It won't be where you need to be, but it will be better than anybody else. You might even feel proud about it. You might even make money. You might even find it's the most defensive play for your company you've ever made. Why is climate change and decarbonisation on the Sainsbury's board agenda every time as a major agenda item? Not because it's part of corporate social responsibility, not because it's part of the nice bit you put at the annual report, that actually the only thing that's done is waste paper and got a whole community of people that write corporate social responsibility reports. It hasn't changed the way we treat anybody. By and large, we give away a few more computers to schools and we pretend we're nice people. No, it hasn't. Okay? It's different. It's there because it's a fundamental business driver. So the argument I'm making is we're not fit for purpose. Smile and be happy about that because you've got the wit to change. It may mean smaller firms. It may mean bigger firms. It will mean more firms fail. That's what change does. The winners win. The brave win. It means taking more chances. It means learning how to model things more before you build them to find out how well they're going to work. We don't do that with the built environment. You do it with planes, you do it with cars, you do it with fridges, you do it with phones. We don't do it with the built environment. We have the technology. We have the virtual realization. We have the probability models. We have the wit and the charm to start playing those things, providing you're willing to go outside your disciplines providing you're willing to go into areas with really difficult boundaries. 
And once you've stepped beyond your engineering scope or your architectural scope, it gets quite scary. Because then the other side, I'm going to argue, you would then have to draw another line. You can't solve the world. You have to draw a line, but wider than you currently are. And that's always been the problem. Those that want to do it solve everything and therefore solve nothing. Those that want to stay inside don't move at all. So that iteration and speed, the willingness to be brave, to make glorious mistakes, or you can put it another way, because you don't tell the client you're going to make a mistake. I was talking to the CEO of Mazda, and I said, you know, Mazda, this is right at the beginning. You know, Abu Dhabi is zero carbon city. Yeah? Foster did the master plan. Fabulous stuff. Fabulous. I said, you know, this is the only, ma this is the biggest low carbon experiment in the world. And it's actually about 900 experiments all going on at once. Unbelievably complex. I said, the ability for you to make that many mistakes at once is stunningly admirable. He wasn't amused. <laughs> I should have put it the other way. Your ability to progress knowledge further than anybody else, brackets, getting it partially right, is admirable. I.e., you're still this much wrong. But let's get it this much right. We are going to run out of time, as am I. So in conclusion, I'm going to say... It is engineering that will change the built environment not the policy makers, not the politicians, to lead it at the rate we now need to change. You've got the policy objectives. They're out there. You can go and read them. Don't ignore them. They're there to be played with. We can move to become a question definer. It's very uncomfortable. It's very scary, and you won't get it right. If you do it successfully, your practice or your firm or your community will do better. I genuinely believe. You can become exporters. You can become actually really enthralled with the challenge. And that's what's the fun bit. I haven't given any indication of how you can do it. Because if I did, we'd be doing it. It's that difficult. It is called innovation. It is called gluing things together in a way you have never glued them before. And accepting that you're going to iterate through society and you're not going to do projects which in five years you go back and say, boy, that was astute. You're going to go back and go, well, that was pretty clever. If I knew now what I knew, I would never have concentrated on the concrete and the, and the carpet. I'd have concentrated on... And if you're not doing that, you're failing. So with that challenge, I'd like to say it's better off you're not comedians. Stay as engineers, stay as architects, stay as built environment scientists. Bring in environmentalists, but get them to focus on getting it slightly wrong, but braver than it was before. Thank you very much. Andy Tong, London South Bank University. Uh, in your talk, you mentioned the word retrofit, I think, once. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the, the challenges for cities like London is that um, in 50 years' time, probably slightly more than 80% of the existing buildings and streets we have now will still be here. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the connecting holes, sewers, underground systems beneath the ground, probably a greater proportion of those will be there. So however well we do with new design, the challenge of retrofitting um, the existing systems and creating the economic incentives to get retrofit, uh, appropriate retrofit, is probably much, much greater. And I'd be very interested in your thoughts as to how we tackle that part of the equation. Um, first of all, I think Southbank did a very good piece of work for, I don't know if you did it for Boris, on um, commercial buildings re um, uh, and um, the standards, which I thought was cracking good, actually. Um, so Southbank's done some excellent work. Um, I mean, first of all, it's quite clear we're not going to rebuild London. This is rather a nice building. Um, I quite like to clad it in about mm, a foot of insulation on the outside, if that's okay. Um, you can't even get consent to do proper double glazed windows. That's going to have to change. We are going to have to change our values on some buildings that you are going to wrap Georgian Britain in um, a different type of insulation 
or are they going to be untenable in any carbon pricing sort of world? Um, uh, so I think you will see values change. Um, you will start to see different technologies. There's a great technology at the moment, which I think is completely specious, which is nano paint. You chuck nano particles in your paint, paint it on the inside, and allegedly it makes your wall, wall, walls warm. Um, I think it's a good scam for selling empty boxes, actually, of nano particles. Um, I think a historic buildings will change. Um, the values will change. Um, there will be a massive compromise for infrastructure. Um, well, it's a really good question about why we're putting the stuff down the sewers we are. I mean, the idea we're sending treated water, which I forget the carbon content of treated water now, but it's gone up in the last couple of years. Um, that you're using it to flush toilets is utterly absurd. And then we pump it, which is utterly absurd. Thames Tideway, a massive environmental improvement for water quality in the Thames in a carbon profile is appalling. It's utterly appalling. In any normal carbon rationed world, you would not do Thames Tideway. Well, that's against the EU directive on water quality. Massive conflicts. So you are going to see some games, which I think um, traditionally, uh, it's interesting that the ICE, half the people there will say Thames Tideway is a sort of crime against humanity, and half will say it's what the work we need to keep ourselves busy tomorrow. Great split. I think you will see different changes. You will see um, uh, uh, power delivered in a more efficient fashion. Um, uh, the grid doesn't work at the moment, we know. Um, uh, much of it is about taking an adaptive reuse of, of um, the, the physical entities that are there and playing with them. Um, one of the great things about technology um, <coughs> is their ability to collect data on systems and use them more efficiently has changed in the last five years beyond all recognition. Um, so I think there is massive potential. I don't think you can rebuild cities. You are going to fiddle with them. There was a question over here, Sam. So. Uh, John Farmer, Privacy So W.S. Atkins, PLC, shareholder. Uh, Mr. Clark, you've rightly highlighted that the grandiose objectives exist, whether... Copenhagen Summit or the Climate Change Act or plans for London alongside a widespread scepticism that the objectives will be met. For example, there was disappointment over the limited achievement of the Copenhagen Summit and there are, from many sources, predictions that the Climate Change Act objectives will not be achieved without substantial uh, rethinking of our present uh, strategies, as you rightly touched on. You've, in your talk, concentrated to some extent on the built environment, but surely the issue is wider than that and touches on energy generation and on transport. And in particular, as I've raised at your own AGM, the issue of nuclear generation in which the country has a pitiful plan to build just four new nuclear power stations. Surely that needs to change. And surely impinging on the uh, built environment is that energy needs to be a lot cleaner to avoid these carbon emissions. I wonder what uh, scope you see for developing a strategy uh, to address these issues uh, and actually get some radical action uh, towards these grand objectives in a context of uh, government cuts and inward-looking sentiments, and how, indeed, your own company might lead in that. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I think there's eight nuclear power stations um, being planned, um, which is pretty sizable. It, however, takes us from about 14% nuclear down to about 8 or 12 um, so we will have a smaller nuclear base in um, about 20 years than we do now um, because the old ones are basically life. They're already gone beyond their life uh, expectancy and they're being extended, um, gratefully, with a lot of work from Atkins, um, which is great work when you get it. Um, so there is a nuclear program. It's been pursued with some vigor. I don't think we can, it can happen any quicker than it is with the eight that's happening. Um, it should have started probably half a decade earlier, but it didn't, so we are where we are. Um, offshore, um, both nuclear and offshore require an equivalent, very round terms, and I, Brown will have a 
clearer view me, needs a, an oil price equivalence of about $120 a barrel to make it economic. You can translate that into a carbon price. Um, the government is committed to significant offshore, and actually we're winning that work now as Atkins. Um, and we've invested in the environmental stuff and some of the structural stuff. In fact, the chap sitting right behind you, Myerson Grant, runs that part of the business. Um, uh, so there is plans to have a balanced energy, a clean energy uh, plan in the UK that's been supported both by the Alliance and it started with the Labour government. Uh, is it sufficient um, and can we afford it? I think the jury is still out because at the moment our economy can't support itself at all, which is why we're going through public sector spending cuts. Um, so I think there is significant progress there. There are people investing. Um, there is uh, phenomenal technical knowledge in a number of companies. We'll make money out of it. What we do need is not the choice, um, uh, and I think uh, the energy secretary was saying it uh, two days ago, um, uh, whom I think it was, um, we are going to have renewables and we are going to have nuclear. It is not a choice. You are going to have both. The energy deficit, even if you do all the energy reductions, and even if you assume the population doesn't grow, and even if you assume we all use the right light bulbs, etc., etc., we are still going to have to have um, a massive rebuilding of our energy and our grid. So that's there under all scenarios, and there is a commitment in law to make it relatively green relatively. So I think it's there. It is underway. It just takes a long time. Is it enough? We hope so. We hope so. But we're not, as a society, willing to have a wind farm on the South Downs. We're not willing to have one in Cornwall. We're not willing to even consider intelligently a tidal barrage across the seven because of the environmental trade-off. Oh, I think that's right or wrong. That's where we are. Two years' time, five years' time, I think that debate changes radically. And one thing I would say for us, and I should have put it in the lecture, actually, one of the things we need to do as an engineering community, I hate to say it, but is to anticipate answers which society will find acceptable in five years' time, I use five years as a, you know, longer than two, um, because, you know, it's a bit like us starting to plan how you make pubs no smoking five years ago. It's only when secondary smoking issues came out that it became acceptable. Society will accept things which we think are unconscionable in time, in incremental steps. We are designing in great big crude lumpen movements Society eases itself forward as a sort of sense of values and behavior. You know, society doesn't go, um, suddenly I'm not sexist or suddenly I'm not racist or suddenly I'm not, you know. We move ourselves forward as a community, as individuals. The profession needs to take some bets. Otherwise, we're always going to be five years too late. And if you're looking at your time frame for decarbonizing, it didn't work. So we have to take that view of what might be acceptable in round terms for the built environment, and I include built environment, includes energy distribution, water distribution, transportation, safety, public realm. I mean, that to me is all built environment. It's, it's all the infrastructure that allows us to work. You know, there's no point in having nice buildings if you can't walk down the road. I'll take a question at the back there. So, and then. Yes, sir, in the middle. James Lovelock, in his book, uh, Revenge of Gaia, which I think is his last book, one, uh, I think recognised the, the scale of the change that was needed and was, you know, actually quite optimistic it could happen, but only after um, whatever it was, a half or three quarters of mankind, you know, billions of people had died because of the effects of climate change. Um, how confident are you that, that we, the engineers, can change our spots to the, the radical extent needed without that sort of driver? Uh, yeah. I, it's always easier to fix things when um, a few people die. Um, preferably, it's not a lot. Um, it's enough that they become individuals 
And um, uh, I think it was I think it was Stalin or Lenin that said, you know, road accident killing 20 is a national tragedy. You lose a million, it's a statistic. It's something quite like that. So you lose, um, you know, a few hundred thousand people in Pakistan. That's kind of unfortunate. You lose, um, you know, five people in a coach crash in France, and that's a national tragedy. I mean, that crudely is the way we think. Um, uh, and I think there, we're, if it's really a cataclysmic event, we go into denial. There's some really good behavioral psychology about really bad news. We do not assimilate. We deny it as individuals. Um, you know, it's a great example, you know, how many Germans knew of the, of the final solution. Actually, not many. They all knew, but they didn't know. And, and you, I don't sort of pick on that, but you could go through many, many instances where you kind of know it's that bad, but you don't know, because that's your protective mechanism. So climate change and, you know, killing Bangladesh, that's inconvenient. Um, what about the mortgage payment? What about the school fees? What about the misbehavior? What about the homework? What about my job security? That's the, the problem. So it needs to be small deaths, preferably of white middle-class people, and usually attractive women, okay? The tsunami was an issue because we killed blonde tourists, okay? Let's be blunt. The tsunami was only a problem because we killed European tourists. You wipe out half of Pakistan, it ain't a problem. For us, we're sitting here white guys, okay? Now, you've got to accept life isn't perfect. That's how we are maybe not individually, but that's how we've behaved. Uh, you look at what we give money to. So climate change is going to be different. Now, I think that's the difference of professionals. Professionals get paid to use judgment. And that's why I think the hope is in the built environment professionals, not in the politicians. Politicians want to get elected. We get paid to think. These institutions are about people who think. What a great asset. That's, that's why I'm optimistic. Two more questions, sir. Uh, in the front and then behind. Hi, uh, Luke Rafferty, Langer Rook. Uh, a quick question, basically to get your opinion on the planning process and how we get things through. I totally believe you that as engineers, we can come up with the solutions and we can make a difference. Uh, but when things like the IPC were scrapped before they even had their first submission, and I think recently, despite that, something that has gone to the IPC, a local councillor has said, or something that didn't go to the IPC, a local councillor has asked to be referred to the IPC because they don't want to be the scapegoats. Uh, how do we make the changes that allow us to get on and create the solutions? Well, um, I think we might look back on the next uh, few years and say that pickles um, is probably the most destructive element um, uh, in our society. Um, his sense of planning and lack of policy um, makes some of Thatcher's liaison-faire look benign. And that's not a political statement. I mean, it's a statement about planning. The idea that, I mean, this goes against any common sense of anyone that's been in the public realm. I've been in, I, I worked for the city of New York at a public official for 10 years, okay? I did economic development in all the boroughs that didn't. I know about public process. I've been in front of community boards that throw things at you, okay? To say that, you know, you're going to vote in your community and take a local decision on things of national interest is utter rubbish, it is so destructive. No one is going to vote for the power station or the prison or the motorway, but I want everyone locked up. I want the lights on. I want to travel quicker. They're not connected. You cannot rely on that sort of public interest. It doesn't work. That's why we have government. I think it's so unbelievably destructive. That's one issue. I have no idea how to solve that with this government. I thought the liberals would have jumped all over it because there's empowerment to the people for those sort of local decisions, is the opposite of democratic. It's the opposite of actually social good. It's about making my street better and bugger yours. It is unbelievably bad. At the same time, we have a planning community made up of mainly Aussies coming through for a year and everybody else going off sick with stress. 
has nothing wrong with Aussies coming through for a year, but it doesn't give a lot of you know, knowledge transfer. And the guys and women who are here, actually the sickness rate through stress in local authority planning departments is I think the number was something like 25% up on the year before. All right? They're also not designed, just a minor issue, neither the building regulations nor the planning system have anything to do with the environment. Planning was about land use and appearance, and building regs was to stop things killing you. All right? That's what building regs, it stops it falling on your head. That's what it's about. So now you've got building inspectors and planners both trying to deal with the, decarb with the lack of something existing, decarbonizing. Okay? Neither have the skill set, neither have the resources. It's a fundamental flaw which we're trying to address through the innovation growth team work that we're doing. Um, uh, we started under Mandelson, is carrying on under, under, under this government. It is a massive area, area of concern. Frankly, if you want to improve the planning system, you put serious money into it and train people to be professions in an in a area they've had no training for. So, you know, if you, if you put wrong people, understaffed, into the wrong thing, you get rubbish. The frictional cost on our society, ignoring the decarbonisation issue, is killing us. It's killing us. Make good decisions, make them quick, and then you start to get democracy. Democracy through death, you know, stop the N25 widening incrementally over 20 years is not democracy. That's a phenomenally bad area, phenomenally bad, and no one's had the guts to go in there and deal with it. Pickles is a nightmare. Um, question right in the front here. He's not here, is he? <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you. Alan Powell from Mac MacDonald. Uh, to did excellent work on Mazda. We tried, um, indeed, and, and a few other things. Uh, actually, uh, that response before I ask the question is convenient lead-in because um, fabulous opportunities you've emphasised um, that we need to change our spots from being solvers to definers. Um, I would, and you're emphasising the built environment. Uh, I would say that that defining element is very strongly in our DNA already and that when we um, serve customers, although they're asking us to be solvers, the only uh, really creative way is to actually, in part, go down the defining uh, role as well. But I think the, the biggest challenge, in other words, we've got the raw materials. I don't think we're at uh, zero starting point, um, but the real uh, challenge, it seems, is this cultural change and how, as engineers, we could work um, in an integrated way because we're not going to do it alone. Um, that, that DNA, I think, was very well expressed on the built environment by uh, Sir Alan Harris, Imperial College, who's, who defined civil engineering as the art of making the world habitable. Mm. So we should be uh, prime candidates, but it's that uh, paradigm shift that uh, seems the biggest challenge, and we're not going to do it on our own. And I'd like to ask you, what kind of feeling have you got uh, Keith from uh, talking to uh, key people around uh, the industry uh, is, is the momentum ready to be tapped or not? Yeah, I think the momentum's there in the young people and the young graduates um, uh, the wit and the awareness and the ability to think outside of their disciplines is the like which I've never seen before the quality of thought is extraordinary um, uh, and the ambition of thought actually is extraordinary. Uh, I have to say, a lot of us middle managers get in the way. A lot of our firm's organisations get in the way. A lot of our quality control systems get in the way. Um, uh, a lot of our... Um, uh, 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 maybe it's just Atkins. Maybe we're just the only stodgy ones around. Um, uh, we don't allow people to make mistakes and get in front of clients young enough. Um, we don't like making mistakes. You know, you lose your reputation. You know, one wobbly bridge, and it's a problem. Um, and we all have them, you know, uh, and we all desperately try to avoid them. But there is a count. If you want to iterate, you've got to take more risks. I think we released the 30-year-olds. Um, They're the people that actually have the ability to move data and information 
with their knowledge of the web, of IT, in a way that people of my age simply don't. We're, we're dinosaurs. They have the intellect and that method of communicating in real time, which leaves us limping a long way behind. Certainly me, I speak for myself here. Um, and that's where the hope is. But you have to get rid of the traditional way we run our offices. We squash too many people. We'll take one more. There it is. That was good. Diogo uh, from, from Brazilian University. I, as you said that uh, we don't need or we shouldn't wait for the politicians, and I, I agree with, with this, where is, will be the potential to promote these changes in the society related with CO2 emissions? Well, um, I, well, I think the fact that you've come to listen to this lecture is kind of heartening. I don't think it's any good for you, but um, it may make you go back and be agitators. Um, uh, the politicians have given you a context. Okay, um, let, let, let me be cheerful again. Copenhagen, I think, was a victory. It's a stunning victory. Now, anyone, I don't know, how many of you have ever been in a four-way negotiation? I mean, a serious negotiation, a business, you know, where real money's at stake between four parties, not two. Four. I've been in a bunch. Okay? It's hard with two. It's challenging with three. It's well nigh impossible with four. And you need serious drugs to get through five. Okay? And there's some good management studies about this. It's exponentially less likely to reach an agreement on anything as the number of parties increase. Every time you add one, it gets exponentially more likely to fail. So that's great. You get every nation in the world to turn up with a very ill-defined agenda, run by a moron in Denmark who hasn't got a clue how to do it, it turns out, okay? With no one having organized some sense way. The maths of the meeting in Copenhagen didn't work. You know, having people just talk and exchange. The maths of the uh, communication didn't work. And yet, You've got 136 country, companies. Read the Cli Climate Change Accord. It's only a couple of pages. It's stunning. A hundred billion to be put into developing worlds in the next couple of years. A hundred billion. Massive. I mean, they won't do it. But if they put in 50 billion, it's changed people's societies in a way we can't even predict. It is a massive victory. So the political context in the midst of the worst economic global recession we're ever likely to see, with the banking community still on its knees, they got together and gave you that context. What a great chance. So the politicians have done their bit. Now it's for you to work in your communities to say, why aren't we addressing climate change on this project? Why isn't it in my syllabus this year? Why are we having a sustainability conference which is talking about having grass on roofs, but it actually doesn't really deal with decarbonizing? Why aren't we pulling this thread really, really hard? You can be an activist. It's not about burning stuff on the streets. It's about changing society. It'll happen because a large number of people will say that's what we demand. And it's an invisible process. Revolution happens like that. It's horribly unpredictable and wonderfully exciting if you're up for the challenge. Keith, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, it's been an extraordinary tour of uh, different aspects of uh, the future of engineering and the future of parts of the planet uh, all combined into one lecture. So thank you for that. If I may, I pick a couple of points. It seems to me one of the things that uh, is both heartening and a challenge is how education of an engineer has changed significantly over time, but how it needs to continue to change. Uh, there's very little place to know only about one discipline. Uh, you may be expert at it, but you better understand how to link uh, right across the boundaries uh, of the art and practice and science of engineering. Uh, and it was pleasing to hear that. Secondly, 
it is uh, uh, always been a great challenge, in, in my view, of how do you actually push people to learn from mistakes, not just simply say they're small corrections on the path to uh, perfection. They are actually mistakes, uh, and they're some of the most powerful learning uh, that you can have, not, I may say, just in engineering, uh, but in politics too. Uh, and thirdly, uh, a piece about uh, policy. I, I find it, I spend uh, a lot of time uh, in the business uh, of trying to change the energy systems of the world. And the world is undergoing a very significant uh, fiscal period of fiscal austerity. Think of it like a very, very big stress test. And after this stress test, uh, we'll know a lot. We may know some very bad things, but we'll know some good things. But during the process, we're you can observe people's behavior. And in spite of all the alarm so far, uh, all the actions taken by politicians uh, to reduce carbon in our environment, none of them have gone backwards. None of them have gone backwards. Right. Now, they haven't actually gone forwards, but <laughs> you wouldn't expect to as the amount of money in the world is shrinking. So I find that uh, a very interesting and heartening uh, point of departure. And after all, I think, as Keith clearly pointed out, uh, to get something done in this world, you have to be an optimist. Keith, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.